Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren and sisters. Great to have you back along with us here this uh, fine Sunday morning here in uh, here in April on April the 5th, the date of uh, this recording, this our second Sunday sermon, our uh, third video overall, started uh, last Sunday, did one, did a video last Wednesday, and now here we are today on this uh, great Sunday morning. I know a uh, pandemic going on around the world, a lot of... Uh, a lot of anxiety and uh, and things, but uh, thankful, amen, that we have peace to the Lord Jesus Christ. We know if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, we are secure, we are safe from uh, whatever the world might throw our way, whatever might happen. So thank the Lord for His grace and for His mercy and all that He has uh, done for us. And... Uh, just uh, by way of announcement, I know we mentioned this in our last couple of videos, but we'll kind of continue to hear maybe some of our new viewers who are just uh, who are just finding us. I am uh, for those of you that uh, that uh, don't uh, don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. R. T. Cooper, uh, church planner to Northern New York. Also uh, write books, write uh, write articles and things, and so you can uh, contact me at according to the word at outlook.com. Once again, that is at according to the word at outlook. Com. That's our email address. We have a uh, YouTube, a YouTube page as well. Our name is Dr. R. T. Cooper, and then on Facebook we are R. T. Cooper Ph.D. So you can uh, find us uh, in any one of those outlets. If you've uh, got any questions, comments, got a prayer request, something you want us to pray about, we'd be happy to mention it here on our uh, <clears throat> excuse me on our live videos. And so that's the uh, ministry that we have. I actually got a few copies here. The books that I have. This is three out of the four that I have in print right now. Really, as soon as this uh, kind of pandemic is over, we're going to publish a lot more. Got a commentary on Malachi, commentary on Joel and Obadiah, and a commentary on Zephaniah and Haggai. Uh, so you can contact me if you want these, or you can go directly to our publisher, The Book Patch, thebookpatch.com. Those are a very, very cost effective. Like I said, those are three out of the four that I have. I also have Jose. I don't have any hard copies of that with me right now. And so, uh, you can get those. Jose is the most expensive one. And it's only $3 and something. Like I said, we don't make a profit out of those at all. And so, uh, you know, that just covers the cost of printing. It's pretty much all that it does. So just to uh, be a blessing to people, encourage people to be more of a student of the Word of God. That's just a part of what my calling is. As I said also, we send out a newsletter every week. We send it out Saturday or Sunday with various topics. Most of the things that we do are... Well, everything that we do is, has something to do with the Bible. Most of the things that we put out are like a topic or a, a topic that uh, that we talk about in the Bible or a uh, like or a description of a Bible character or principle, something of a, a something of that nature. And if you'd, uh, as I said, contact me as well if you'd like that, put you on the email li email list. A lot that's free, you know, no no cost whatsoever, totally free. And so uh, that uh, would uh, probably be a, uh, hopefully would be a blessing to you and educate you more in the Word of God. And um, also, like I mentioned, the books as well, like on the book patch, you can also get those in ebook form. You know, if you get that in ebook form, that's even less expensive, you know, than just like $3 and something, you know, that I think the book of Jose is. So, because uh, I know a lot of people like me, you know, they do ebooks now. They're more cost effective. You know, if you download that onto your computer or tablet, you know, that's easier to carry around. Like you go traveling or something, you know, you have a multitude of books just right there. And so, uh, so I'll uh, keep uh, keep those things in mind. Hopefully, it would uh, be a help and a blessing to you. Of course, we always desire your prayers for the studying and the writing that we do, for the church planning work that we have. We plan to move this uh, this summer. Already got a couple of families there looking for a Bible believing church. So thank the Lord for them and the blessing and encouragement that they've already been to us. Just uh, just uh, by way of prayer request, a couple things I would like to mention. I've got a special request, not for me, but for another. Other young man, I'd like you to remember him. A good, good young man, very fired up though. We got a couple of things going on. Just the devil, the devil really just fighting him, and so just uh, 
pray for him as you uh, if you uh, if you would please and uh, all those on the bed of affliction uh, on uh, that have sickness and all let's pray for them of course our, our world really in this day and time this pandemic that's going on and it really just about affects everybody in the world and uh, so just pray one for another and that we would do what we ought to do and be what uh, what we ought to be amen and so uh, we will be back again uh we'll upload the video either tuesday or wednesday uh do our midweek study midweek studies a little bit more teaching not quite as much like a sermon where you preach but kind of a little bit more uh teaching usually on wednesdays you know we uh, we take one of the articles that we've written in our newsletter and kind of just go over that in, in more detail in a video form and one that i'm really really excited about that i just wrote is going to come out today on our newsletter. It's titled Television, the One-Eyed God. Television, the One-Eyed God. I know um, when television kind of first came out, I know a lot of fundamentalists, especially more conservative type people, really, really railed against television. But now, though, that's a thing that's just, you know, widely, widely accepted. But uh, the thing that we point out, though, in that video is how television is just that, the one-eyed God. How it really, really just uh, takes precedent over, you know, over over people's lives and everything. And how that really consumes people. Like uh, those of you that, uh, that, uh, that, that know me, I've already mentioned these videos. Like, I'm a big, big student of church history. And, like, those great awakenings and revivals that happened, you know, that... Those really happened before the time of television. The most of them, like in the 17 and 1800s, television wasn't available until about 1930, around there. And, you know, they didn't have the distractions that we have. You know, they didn't have, you know, television, you know, and, and things of that nature, video games and all. And I think that's really one reason why God used them so much was because they since spent all of their time, you know, the majority of their time praying in the Word of God and all. And now kind of with all the distractions that we have, television, you know, really being the most prominent at one, you know, we don't, uh, <clears throat> believers in this day and time, you know, they just don't spend time in the Word of God, don't spend time praying as they should. So, you know, that's really one reason why God called me, I believe, to do this type of ministry, because we really need more, more, uh, more people, you know, in this type of ministry, you know, being a student of the, uh, of the Word of God and uh, doing, uh, and uh, doing the Lord's work here. And so we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. As as we said, I, I put it on I put it on social media a couple a few day, day or two ago that our message would be biblical holiness, and that is how the Lord has directed us here. <clears throat> biblical holiness. Uh, as we said, we did two uh, two other videos. Just want to make mention of that. If you'd like, I highly, highly encourage you to go back and look at those as well. Very informative and all. The Sunday sermon we did last week was the ministry of prayer and fasting. That's uploaded on. Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Then the video that we did was what does the Bible say about alcohol? Did that one last Wednesday. <clears throat> So I encourage you to go uh, take a look at that as well. And uh, here, looking at biblical holiness, we've got a lot of text that we're going to cover. I use a lot of scripture. I use a pretty good bit of scripture, like in the messages that I preach and uh, things that I teach and all, because, you know, it's the Word of God. The Word of God is what works. The Word of God is the, you know, it's the truth. It doesn't really matter what I think or what somebody else thinks or has to say about it, but what does the Word of God say about it? You know, that is the only authority, the way I look at it. I know a lot of people use the terminology, the final authority, but really, you know, it's the only authority. It's what we're going to give an account to. I'm not going to give an account to a politician or to a preacher or to a to a denomination or, you know, to a, to a mission board, nothing of that nature. You know, we're all going to stand just before God Almighty, and He's given us His Word and His statutes here. So, you know, all the... I know we have other authorities like parents, you know, pastoral authority, but, you know, that authority is from the Bible. So the Bible, you know, being the authority, you know, that uh, that we uphold ourselves, so like even our earthly authorities that the, that, that the Word of God has ordained, you know, those are people who have to give an account to God and, you know, they must carry out their leadership like me as a soon-to-be pastor, you know, must carry out my pastoral authority according to what the Word of God says. And so here we come to a very, very uh, familiar 
your text if you've uh, been in church, been around the Bible any time long, hear about holiness. That's a very common one, but a good one that'll springboard us. That's said we've got a lot, a lot of text to go over here. I've got these marked in my Bible, so that'll kind of save us some time. I've kind of got bookmarks here to get to them, but I have several. And so just, uh, so whenever we kind of have to flip, you know, that'll just give us an opportunity to catch our breath a little bit. And then First Peter, chapter number one here, First Peter. And chapter number 1, reading verses 15 and 16, it says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And looking at that uh, subject there, biblical holiness. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do love you this morning. Thank you for the units of sin. Thank you for all that you've done, all the many blessings that you've bestowed upon our hearts and upon our lives. Thank you for loving us, for being so good to us. Don't take it for granted the opportunity to uh, call upon your name and to worship you in the spirit and the truth, even in these uh, perilous times that we live in, these uh, odd times of COVID-19 going on, the opportunity to meet over, uh, to meet over uh, the cyber waves. And that you would just bless your people here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for those that have tuned in. Don't take it for granted that they've tuned in. No, they could be doing anything else, Lord. But you brought them here uh, with us. And just pray we'd be a blessing to them uh, here this morning. Or whenever they may listen to this or listen to this message, Lord. Just may we be biblically holy. Oh, how we need another revival. Oh, how we need to be stirred up again. A people on fire for you. Just pray you'd bless the word here this morning, Lord. And help us like only you can. Do that mighty work in us, mighty work through us. And be careful to give you all and all the praise and all the glory for all because you are the Lord for it's in Christ and we humbly pray. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> and so here looking at this subject of biblical holiness. Now, I know there was a time, especially, you know, in the Western, in the Western world, you know, like in Western Europe and North America, whenever we had a lot more Bible-believing Christians, and you could just say holiness, and people knew what that meant, you know, they knew you were talking about biblical holiness, you know, many, many years ago, even when, not just independent fundamental Baptist, you know, but when even a lot of other Protestant denominations, you know, like Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and so forth, and I know there's still some of them, a few of them that might be a little, that might be kind of conservative, but you know, now in this day and time in the 21st century, you know, whole biblical holiness is just not something that a lot of people know a lot of, as we'll look at here. The idea of holiness to people in this day and time is a lot different, you know, than it was, you know, back in the 1800s, you know, early 1900s. As we have newly evangelicals, you know, we have modern New Age Christians, you know, that are just much, much liberal, that have left the Word of God. And there's certainly a message that people need to need to hear is about biblical holiness. Like I said in our video that we did last Wednesday about, uh, <clears throat> about alcohol, <clears throat> you know, there was a time whenever, uh, you know, whenever most whenever most Christians, you know, rejected alcohol altogether. But now, you know, in this day and time, you know, we even have Baptists, you know, Baptists were people that have been historically known, you know, to be staunchly against alcohol. But now we even have Baptists, you know, who embrace alcohol. And we have that newly evangelical philosophy, uh, you know, where they just don't want to hear these types of terms. You know, these types of terms are no longer popular among, among, among many, many evangelical Christians. You know, they don't want to hear terms like holiness, separation, uh, conviction, <clears throat> Uh, you know, set apart, you know, any 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 type of language like that, you know, they wanna they wanna say, well, let's just embrace the world, go along with the world, try to reach people by being worldly. That's really the philosophy of many many so-called believers in this day and time. But we'll see here that that's uh, that's a philosophy that isn't biblical, and that's just a philosophy that doesn't work. It just does not work uh, on people. You know, you can get a lot of people into a church, like I thought. I went up to, uh, uh, went, went, uh, went anywhere and started a church. And, you know, when I just let my standards go and I didn't preach against anything, you can get a lot of people in a church by just compromising and being worldly. But the problem is the power of God's not going to be there and no lives are going to be changed. We'll look here at biblical holiness. Well, what does the term holy mean? That's what it means. It means to be set apart. To set apart or to rise above. To rise above. To be set apart from this world. Because as God's people, we are to be different. 
And that's just that's just the biblical reality. God's people are different than other people are. That's been God's intentions from the from the beginning of time. Like right now, I'm writing. I know I've mentioned this, but it, but it's really good, very very applicable to this. Like I'm writing a commentary on the book of Leviticus, you know, and that's what that book is all about. Like this te- verse here that uh, Peter that uh, that Peter's preaching from here. That's actually from the book of Leviticus. He's preaching here from the uh, from the from Leviticus 11:44. That's where it's quoted from. Because see, like the book of Leviticus back in Old Testament times, like I said, a good I think a good way to uh, uh, just to uh, kind of term to term the book of Leviticus is it's God's holiness personified in the Old Testament. Because from the very beginning, God wanted His people Israel to be different than all the other nations. He wanted them to be different than all the other than all the other people of the world. And that's still very applicable to us as New Testament believers. We are to be holy. We are to be set apart. We are to be different. We are a peculiar people. Like Jesus said it. You know, he said, he said the world's going to hate you because it hates me. You follow me, the world's going to hate you because the world, the world doesn't like holiness. The world and, and their flesh, they don't like conviction. They don't want to have anything to do with it. But we are to be set apart. God is holy. That's our first point. You know, plain and simple, God is holy. God himself is holy. God in his character, he rises above the standard of this world. And that's what he wants for his children. Well, see, God's holiness speaks of his exalted status. We'll go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 63. Isaiah chapter number 63. Got it here. Isaiah 63 and verse number 15. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me are they restrained? See, look down from heaven. And behold, from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. See, God is holy. That's his greatest attribute. Yes, you know, God is love. God is a God of mercy and and, and a number of other things. But God is holy. God rises above men. God rises above angels. He rises above all creatures. He rises above everything. That is just his character. That's why he is God. He has an exalted status. He has a higher standard than what men has. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have to have the Bible. That's why I have the type of ministry that I have. Is because just us men and our infinite mind and and our heart and our infinite being, you know, we can't, uh, uh, we can't, we couldn't comprehend. We couldn't comprehend. We couldn't know God's holiness just on our own. That's why we have to have the Bible, the living book. The Bible that is alive. That is from God. That's how we know about His holiness. That's why this Bible, you know, it, God used men, but they are only penmen. God is the author of this book. And without it, we couldn't know anything about God's holiness. But His holiness speaks of His exalted status. And also there, staying in the book of Isaiah, in chapter number 6, and verse number 3, talking here about, uh, says, And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, that's the saram there, the saram, the angelic beings. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. See here, God's holiness is the special ground of reverence and adoration. Also in the book of uh, Psalm, the 111th Psalm. And verse number 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. See, God's name is holy. That's just that's just the attribute of God. The attribute of God that uh, 
that, uh, that we can't miss, that you can't get by. That's just who he is. Psalm 71, 22, it says, I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God, unto thee will I sing with a harp, O thou Holy One of Israel. God's holiness, that's the special ground of reverence and adoration to him. And it is the standard of all holiness. Matthew 5, 48. It says, Matthew 5, 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Like you want to talk about perfection? That is God. That is His holiness. As we said there, that is the standard of all holiness. And that term there, like in Matthew 5, 48, talking about completion, like he's telling the Lord's people, you need to be complete as God is complete. Just like God perfected his commandments, perfected his statutes, perfected his morals, us as a people, we are to get to that place of completion. No, we will never ever be sinlessly perfect, but we can be complete though. Be a complete people. And live a holy life. Love as we should love. Have mercy on people that we should have mercy. Be separated as we ought to be separated. <coughs> have that complete balance in our lives. You know, that steady diet of feeding on the Word of God. Feeding in prayer. Being the witness that we ought to be. Giving to the Lord's work in the way that, sh that we should. You know, with our finances and with our time. With our prayers. Having the, having our heart where it ought to be, having a heart for the Lord, a heart for the a heart for the Lord's work, having that heart for God, being that spouse we ought to be, parent that we ought to be, son or daughter that we ought to be, being that member of God's kingdom that is profitable. That's the standard of holiness that we are to get. And see, and here is a big reason why, like why the newly evangelicals and all, like the modern New Age crowd, this is uh, this is one of the things that they really, really oppose here. Our next point, we go to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, and verse number 13. If you're following along with us, I know Habakkuk, that's one of the least familiar books of the Bible. It's in the Minor Prophets, kind of right in the middle of the Minor Prophets. You go all the way to the end of the Malachi, flip back a few, and you'd be in Habakkuk, chapter 1, and verse number 13. Habakkuk here writes, he was a prophet to the southern kingdom Judah, a prophet just before they went into uh, just before they went into captivity, whenever they were conquered by Babylon. And he writes here talking about Judah, Habakkuk says, talking to God, he says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. And canst not look on iniquity, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? See, Habakkuk is saying there in this text, saying, Judah, they are wicked people, Lord. Me as a prophet, I just see how wicked they are. That they're, they're, not living, they're not living the law, keeping your statutes as they should. You have pure eyes than to look on this. Say, no doubt, oh, how we need preachers who will proclaim that type of message right there about the world that we live in. See the modern New Age people. That's that's a big reason why they don't like they don't like holiness. Because see, God's holiness implies the divine opposition to sin and condemnation. If you're taking notes or whatever, that's really our letter D under our first point that God is holy. It implies the divine opposition to sin and condemnation to all sin. And also like Isaiah, chapter number 6, and verse number 5. This is like when God was calling, uh, was calling Isaiah to be a prophet. This is what Isaiah thought of himself. He said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. 
because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah says, I see how holy, how holy God is, and I just don't think I'm qualified to be a prophet. Me as a man, I know how corrupt I am. But because of God's grace, because of God's grace, God still uses us. Because of God's grace, we live that holy, clean life. That's how we obtain it, is by God's grace. As we'll, as we'll look at, uh, look at a lot, lot more of that, you know, later on, uh, later on here in the message. It has to do with our second and third point. Us as men, we are a corrupt people. We have a sin nature. And see, God is opposed to sin and condemnation. That's why, that's why that newly evangelical principle doesn't work. You cannot be like the world. You cannot embrace the sin of the world because God's holiness is simply opposed to it. It's staunchly opposed to it. And we'll look here. Our next point here, letter E. That if you're taking notes, number one, God is holy. Letter A, God's holiness speaks of his exalted status. B, it is the special ground of reverence and adoration. C, it is the standard of all holiness. D, it implies the divine opposition to sin and condemnation to all sin. And now letter E, it is revealed to men as setting before them the highest end of their aspiration and hope and endeavor. See, that's simply, that's what we should shoot for this morning. I'm not to try to be like the world. I'm to try to be holy as God is, as His Word commands. Like we said there, our opening text, 1 Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, as we said, the Apostle Peter, he got that from the book of Leviticus, the book that's just all about God's holiness. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 7 where it says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. See, as we said here, the people of Israel, they had to be different than all the other nations of the world. And you'd actually look, if you look at this verse in its context, you'll see here that he's actually talking about witchcraft. Like witchcraft and the occultism, you know. That, that's not a new idea that, that just came out with Disney or, or Steven Spielberg or Hollywood, you know, horror movies or anything of that nature. Like we look here at verse number 6, we'll read it in its context. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards... To go whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. See, God's people are not to have any part of what the world has. See, we're not to take part in these horror movies that are, that promote that. Or like I said, even Disney, I know people, they, they look at Disney as just being some innocent children's movies. No. Look at the man Walt Disney. You'll see that he was a very, very ungodly person. I think he's passed away now. But he was simply an ungodly man. And I know we look at things like that, like as being innocent. But look at, look at all that the man promotes with those movies and witchcraft, wizardry bestiality, like the Beauty and the Beast. See, that he, the Walt Disney was a wicked, wicked man, and he wants to infiltrate children with all that as children. It's not just innocent cartoons, like I said next Wednesday. This coming Wednesday, we're doing a video about television, and we'll go over some of that. See, we're not to take part in any of that stuff. That's just, that's just how the world is. And also Exodus chapter number 19, verses 3 and 6 also goes along with, uh, with this text here. Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, 
Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and now how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. See, that's what we've been saying from the get-go, kind of been our theme here. God's people are to rise above this world. We're a peculiar people. As Moses writes here, we're a peculiar treasure. We don't belong to the kingdoms of this world. We belong to the kingdom of God. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. See, that's our aspiration to be holy, to be a holy nation, to be a holy people. We'll look here at the Psalm 98. Psalm the 90th Psalm in verse number 8 here. Once again, not another another popular verse here that people like to hear with a principle. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. See also here under our first point that God is holy, letter F. God's holiness is adapted to awaken slash deepen the human conscience of sin. See, God's holy is adopted to awaken, deepen the human conscience of sin. See, that's a big reason why people don't like the Word of God. Because the Word of God is alive. That's why our governments, you know, our businesses, our schools, our institutions, they don't want the Word of God anywhere. Because the Word of God brings conviction. Like we said from the beginning, God's Word is, is how we see God's holiness. That's how we live that holy life. Because see, God's holiness, it shows us our sin. Our sin, our inability, the conscience that we have of sin. It brings it to light. Brings conviction. Like once again, you know, that's just kind of the, the, the modern New Age Christianity people. You know, they don't want to feel convicted. Like back when I was in the military, back when I was in the military, like I was telling a lady about an independent Baptist church kind of next to where she lives. She said, no, I don't go to churches like that. There's too much pressure. I want to go to a church where there's no pressure. She told somebody that right after I told her that. I just go to these non-denominational churches, you know, that don't preach a whole lot about sin or nothing. See, people, they don't want to have anything to do with the Word of God. They don't want to have anything to do with real Bible-believing Christianity because it reveals their sin. But that's just the Word of God. A person that has a heart for God, we'll see even more here in a little bit, they want to be holy. They have that desire, just like our original text says here. We should have that heart to be holy as God is holy. And that really closes us out there with our first point that God is holy. And now we'll look at that number two. We'll look at holiness and salvation. Holiness and salvation. We'll go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in chapter number 3. Let's see how sal God's holiness is in salvation. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Look at the apostle Paul's language here. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Because salvation is a heavenly calling. There is holiness in our salvation. We don't neglect holiness. That's not just a holiness. You know, that's not just some word that uh, that, that Pharisees use that, uh, that we should have no part in. No, that's biblical. Very biblical. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4 to go along with that point as well. According as he hath chosen us in him. See, we are God's people. Chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, God saves people to be holy. God's people are to be a holy people. If you've repented of your sins and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Ghost lives in you. See, that's His name, the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. See, He, the Holy Ghost, lives in us, 
so we can rise above, so we can live according to God's standard, because we can't do that in itself. Now, I'm thankful this, this uh, morning that I was raised in a Christian home. I had Christian parents, but just like everybody else, I was born lost. I was born in sin. And whenever, before I was saved, I had no interest in the things of God. I wanted to be as much like the world as I could. Now, thank God I never was way, way out in the world, like on drugs or alcohol or anything like that. But I love the rock music. I love the rock music. I love the horror movies. It's what I live for. Like in the house of God on Sundays, I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in worshiping God. I couldn't wait till church was over so I could get home and watch the NASCAR race or, or watch the NFL ball game. But see, after God saved me, God put something else in me. And the more and more we grow, see, look at that term there, grow. You know, grow, that means go up, get bigger. Like we grow in the Lord, we become more and more holy. See, that's like holiness, not popular in this day and time, but that is just something that is biblical. That is just plain and simple biblical Christianity. See, number two there, we see our holiness and salvation. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And now we look at holiness and righteousness and moral purity. See, this is like a process. That's what comes after. But as we said there, whenever somebody, you know, somebody first gets saved, you know, that they don't know everything. When somebody gets saved, you know, they don't know everything. They're a babe in Christ. Like, I don't expect somebody who just got saved last week, you know, to know as much about the Word of God as somebody that's been saved for 10 years. It is a process. But as we said, though, it is growing. We grow in the Lord. We mature. Just like a human being, like my daughter, when she was first born as an infant, she couldn't do nothing. About the only thing she could do was cry and drool. But now she's almost five years old. She could do a lot more things now. She can walk, she can talk, etc. Just like walking with God. The, the more and more, the older that we get in the Lord, the more and more we are to mature and grow. And be more righteous and have more moral purity. Like Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse number 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their captivity, the Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. See, as we said there, like Jeremiah, he was also a prophet to Judah, just as Habakkuk was. I think Habakkuk was probably a, was a, was a little after, was uh was uh, was a little after, or about the same time, or I think more more so about the same time as uh, as Jeremiah there. But he's talking here though about whenever Judah gets out of captivity, whenever their captivity is over, when they go back to Jerusalem. When they go back to Jerusalem, they're going to be a holy people because before they were not, they were corrupt and they had to go into captivity. They had to go into captivity. But then whenever they leave captivity and they go back to Jerusalem, they're going to be on a mountain of holiness. Because see, that's what they have to do. They have to be a righteous. They have to be a moral people. That's what God called them to be. And of course, thank God that they did go back to Jerusalem because after they went back to Jerusalem, they produced the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 75 Luke 175, where it says, In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. See, that's actually Zacharias there, the father of John the Baptist, singing a song about the holiness and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24 as well. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, that new man is righteous and holy. The Holy Ghost now living in us. We are righteous and we are to be a holy people. That is the, uh, that is the attributes 
of the new man to be holy and to be righteous. Then also here Romans chapter 6 and verse number 19. Romans 6, 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and unto holiness. It's telling the church of Rome, you were a corrupt people, just like your forefathers, Judah and Israel, who had to go into captivity. You need to quit living that life of iniquity and start being holy and pure. To God's people, we are a separated people. So that was letter A, um, number, number, number two, holiness and righteousness and moral purity. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, the church of Corinth. If you know the Bible, you know they weren't what they were supposed to be. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. I like that there. Perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Getting our holiness complete. Getting to that stage of completion where we keep all of the Lord's statutes and all of His commandments. In the fear of God. See, the real fear of God is not being scared because I'm scared God's going to chastise me. The real fear of God is not wanting to let God down. I've got a message I preach out of the book of Deuteronomy that explains that very, very well. Man, you know how the book of Deuteronomy uses that terminology time and time again about the fear of God. It's because God is so good. God is so wonderful. God saved me from hell. God provides for me. God's my reason for living. That I do not want to let him down. I do not want to fall back into sin to let him down. I want to represent him in that facet that is pleasing unto him. See, a holiness and a cleansing from sin. That's letter B there. Holiness and a cleansing from sin. And also 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Of course, also chapter number 5 and verse number 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's the deepest verse in the Bible right there. That we abstain from all appearance of evil. To be holy. Because that is a cleansing from sin. Once again, we get that from prayer. From reading the Word of God. From spending time in the Word of God. It's what it all just what it all really goes back to. Where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. That's the problem with newly evangelicals in this modern Christianity. Their treasure's not in the things of God, their treasure's in the things of the world. They love the things of the world more than they love the things of God. But thank the Lord here. Letter number C. Holiness in the blood of Christ. Holiness in the blood of Christ. Hebrews as well, chapter 9 and verse number 12. We got a good bit of text to read here. Starting here at verse 12. We'll read here verse first starters 12 to 14. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption for us, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? See, like I mentioned there, like about the book of Leviticus, all about the laws. 
the laws of the offerings and the sacrifices. They had to present uh, the bullocks, the rams, and the, uh, and the goats and so forth for the sin offerings and the burnt offerings. How much more should we desire to be holy because Jesus Christ did that for us? See, this morning, I love the Old Testament. That's really like what my professional term would be, an Old Testament theologian. I love the Old Testament, but I'm glad this morning that I don't have to, I don't have to offer those sacrifices. Like I just kind of kidding around, told my wife and daughter, I said, if we lived in Old Testament times, you know, I'd probably be, I'd probably be in Ezra. I'd be a priest and a scribe. Because I'm a preacher and scribes, they were people who wrote, you know, like they wrote commentary and all about the law and I love to write. But I'm glad that I don't have to keep those laws here this morning. I don't have to go sacrifice animals because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. He did it all for us. So all that we have to do is accept Him as our Lord and Savior, ask Him to come into our hearts and repent of our sins. And that should motivate us even more to live holy. Just like they had to live holy in Old Testament times by keeping those laws. We don't have to this morning. We have the ultimate sacrifice. We have one who made the atonement for our sin. That's holiness in the blood of Christ. Also verses 20 to 25. Saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. See, like there, they had the holy place, the holy of holies, where only the priest could go. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth in the holy place every year with blood of others. See, we don't have to have that anymore, friend. We have access with God. Like we said, like only the priest could go into the holy place, the holy of holies. Like if you go back and you study the tabernacle of Old Testament times. But through Jesus Christ, we have that access with God this morning. We don't have to go to a, to a high priest. We can get down on our knees and pray and feel the glory of God come down. Amen. See, how much more should that motivate us to live holy? That we do not have to keep the laws of the Old Testament and by their principles. Holiness in the blood of Christ. That was letter C. And now number three here. This is our last point. Thank you for your kind attention. I know we've been going a little over 45 minutes now, but this is our last point. Well, we should be through here in about 10 minutes or so, I believe. Holiness and our walk with God, number three. Like we read that there, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. That's our, our text also for this third point. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Because that is our walk with God. Simply in our walk with God, we are to be holy as God is holy. We are his children. We are to live according to his standards. Just, you know, like with, with my daughter, just like you with your kids. Or, you know, kids that you had before if you're older and they don't live in your house anymore. You know, you have standards for them. They have to live according to your standards. Just like we are to live according to our Heavenly Father's standards, God. Simply starting off here, how about holiness in our daily life? Holiness in our daily life. That's letter A. We find that here in the book of Colossians in chapter number 3 and verse number 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, talking about saved people there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, a Cal, I'm not a Calvinist, but before the I believe Jesus died for everybody, but just like another verse that we read before said, before the foundation of the world, God knew who would be saved because God is sovereign. God, nothing surprises God. God is sovereign. He knew who would be saved and therefore he elected them before the foundation of the world. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, 
Verse number 14, for bearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. See, we've saw that term time and time again, perfectness, talking about completion. You know, obviously not that us as people will ever live a complete, sinless, perfect life, but being complete, that means getting to a getting to a getting to an age of maturity, getting to a mindset and a heart set of maturity, like where we are mature believers. You know, where we have that daily time with God, daily time in the Word, daily time in prayer, like, like having the principles that this text talked about here. You know, being humble, having mercy, forgiving other people, being on suffering, not holding grudges, not quarreling, not, not, not being like a baby and arguing with other people in the church. But having that bond of perfection, of perfectness, like it says there, putting on charity, putting on the love of God, having those biblical principles. Holiness in our daily lives, doing that in our daily life. See, having that holiness in our daily life, that, that shows that level of maturity like nothing else. Holiness in our daily life, also holiness in our worship. I actually quoted this verse here last Wednesday when we did the video about alcohol. Because see, whenever you take part in the things of the world... When you take part in the things of the world, you're not going to do what this text here says. It's the direct opposite of all that. You can't pop open, uh, pop open and drink a beer, or listen to, or listen to rock music or hip hop music or or watch filthy stuff on the television, and do what Psalm 29 2 says here. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's how we are to worship. That shows our character. Seeing the glory of God. Seeing the Lord's glory and His honor. Holiness in our worship. That's letter B. Letter C. Holiness in the Word of God. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in, furnace, in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven being the number of completeness in the Bible. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Holiness in the Word of God. See, the Word of God is what we have. The Word of God is what we're preaching from. See, our lives should revolve around the Word of God this morning. Should revolve around the Word of God, not the television, not what the world has, not anything else, but the Word of God. It's our standard. Holiness in the Word of God, holiness in our testimony. 19th Psalm, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. See, when somebody really gets saved and somebody repents, there's going to be a desire in their heart to live for God. If you don't have that desire this morning, then I'm afraid what you have isn't real. Now, that doesn't mean, once again, that you'll be perfect or that you won't backslid. But even a person in a backslidden estate, they're going to have a desire in their heart to get back to where they ought to be. <coughs> Like we know Peter, he was a man who denied even knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But that wasn't really his heart's desire. He was just too scared. He was scared that he would have been killed along with the Lord Jesus Christ because he probably would have been. But there's no doubt, amen, that the Apostle Peter repented. Because after that, the next time you read about the Apostle Peter, he's in the book of Acts preaching the word of God, seeing thousands of people saved. Yes, a person can get backslid, even a preacher. I know some great phenomenal preachers who have got backslid on God. But thank God for most of the ones that I know, they didn't stay there. They had a desire in their heart to get back to where they knew they should have been. And they repented. Holiness in our testimony. 
Because obviously God, as I said, I'm not a Calvinist. God made man with a free will. Even right now, as myself, I have a free will. I could close the Bible, get out of the ministry. But that's not what my heart's desire is. And the only way, like our, our last point there about the Word of God, that's how we stay holy is in the Word of God. Staying in the Word of God. Having that time. Like the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. I know that I have a problem in my flesh. That's why I have to die daily. I have to get up and pray. I have to get up and read the Word of God. I have to start my day with the Lord. Because I know I still live with my flesh. I don't I don't even know the preacher's name, but I heard a fellow before who was a part of a Bible college and he said uh he was telling the story about an evangelist about an evangelist an evangelist who was a powerhouse preacher he was like a poster boy for that Bible college and he got out of God's will he fell he fell off into sin and got out of the ministry and he said that that evangelist tells everybody he says, I want everybody to know so it doesn't happen to them. But I thought, I thought that I was so good that I was just at such a, such a high, high state of holiness and perfection. I didn't think that I had to do my daily devotions anymore. It all started just because I quit spending that time with God. I, I quit having my time in the Word of God because I just didn't think I needed it anymore. But see, everybody does. Even, even great preachers, like I said, the Apostle Paul is wonderful and as marvelous as he was. He said, I have to die daily. I have to spend time in the Word of God. If I want to be that holy, separated man of God that I ought to be, I got to die. I got I to gotta kill my flesh and get in the Word of God and get in prayer. Holiness in our testimony. Holiness and being separated from the world. Start there. We'll read Psalm 26 all the way to 27 two. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. That's a great thing there about the book of Psalms. In a lot of these Psalms, you really, really see the heart of David. See, he says, judge me, O Lord. That's the, you know, that's the direct opposite terminology of the modern New Age Christianity crowd. Don't judge me. Don't, don't tell me I'm wrong. Don't, don't preach against the things that I do. I'm just being me. Yeah, and what you are, friend, is ungodly. What you are is carnal. That's what your flesh is. You're carnal because you are seeking after the flesh. <clears throat> But you see, David here, he's the direct opposite. He says, judge me, O Lord. I want you to judge me. Verse number two, he continues, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. See, that is a great picture of a believer who really has a heart for God. Somebody that wants to be examined. Somebody that wants to be judged. Somebody who wants God to convict them. Like I told you that story about that lady I knew back when I was in the military. They don't want to feel any pressure or be convicted. But a real believer wants to be convicted. Because they want to be more like God. They want to be a holy, God-called, separated from the world believer. See, that's what this point is here. Point number E. Holiness is being separated from the world. A real believer that has a heart for God, they don't want to be more like the world. They want to be more like God. They want to be like His holiness. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with the dissembler. See, there it is right there, separation from the world. He says, I'm not going to go. I'm not, I'm not going to go fellowship and go hang around with vile people. Verse 5, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands with innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. 
Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Ah, he said, I love the house of God. Hey, I can't be more clear right there, crystal clear. I love the house of God. I love the things of God, but I hate the world. I hate the works of darkness. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. Chapter 27, Now the Lord is mine light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. See, David says the enemies, the people of this world, the devil, they can't take me because I am secure in the Lord's holiness. See, somebody that has saturated, that has saturated their life with the Word of God and with prayer, who have saturated their lives with the things of God, like people who have separated themselves from the world, who have separated themselves from the works of darkness. See, the devil won't be able to get you. Those foes of the world, they won't be able to get you. As David said, they will stumble and they will fall. See, holiness is being separated from the world. It's obviously plain and simple. Holiness is the opposite of uncleanness. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse number 8. And an highway shall be there, and a way in it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. See, God's holiness is the opposite of uncleanness. Unclean people, they don't want anything to do with the holiness of God. They don't want anything to do with the things of God. And just like a real holy person, a person that has a heart and a mind, set on the things of God, they don't want any part of what the world has. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Like I've heard people too, like use that personality. They're just they're just being themselves using their own personality. Yes, we have different personalities, but living godly has nothing to do with a personality. Like I had a man tell me that whenever he was uh, th th this was a man who was really really big in the Christian heavy metal scene. Like he was actually telling me like about a really popular Christian heavy metal band, like how they drunk alcohol all the time and got drunk. He said, yeah, like them boys, hey, you know. They had me under the table drinking, getting drunk. They're just, he, he, that's the terminology he used. They're just being themselves. They're being their flesh. They're living their carnal flesh. They're not being what God wants them to be. Because the Bible bluntly condemns that. The Word of God bluntly condemns it. God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. See, people like that, their problem is it's not their personality. That's not a matter of being an extroverted or an introverted person or a person who's more sensitive, you know, or, or a person who's more blunt and outspoken. That's just a matter of ungodliness versus godliness. That's all that is. That's a matter of being holy and being ungodly. Like with those people there, that's just a matter of them feeding their flesh rather than feeding their spirit. That's a matter of people who are just more interested in worldliness than they are godliness. Because what does it say there? Another very, very familiar text out of the book of Matthew. Chapter number 6 and verse number 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have the world and God. It doesn't fit. It doesn't match. It's a contradiction. 
You know, that's like uh, like I said when I did that video last Wednesday about alcohol. You know, even, even a lot of lost people, you know, they realize that principle. You know, like most of my lost relatives. I mean, you know, they, they, they're people who were raised in the Bible Belt, and they've been around preaching and things. So, you know, they know a little bit more about principles than people outside of the Bible Belt do, yes. But, you know, even a lot of lost people, you know, they understand this principle. Like I say that because I remember also a lot back when I, was a, when I was a teenage preacher boy. And I was around a couple of people. One of them was a lost gentleman. And somebody, somebody mentioned Christian rock music. And that lost gentleman there, he actually said that. He said, Christian rock, that sounds like a contradiction. You know, how can that go together? How can, how can Christianity mix with rock and roll? See, even a lot of lost people, know, you know, realize that. It's, it's things that don't go together. You can't feed your flesh and feed your spirit. You can't take a part of something as ungodly as the rock, heavy metal, hip-hop scene and take part in the biblical scene. It just doesn't work. Like it says there, you can't serve God in mammon. You can't serve God in your flesh. It's a contradiction. It doesn't work. God's holiness and worldliness, they're two opposite things. They don't go together. Because, see, that's actually what a lot of that is. Like the, the Christian rock scene, the newly evangelical philosophy. It's man's way of thinking. It wasn't invented by God. It was invented by men. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. See, that's our next letter under here. Like letter F was the holiness is the opposite of uncleanness. I don't think I mentioned that clearly. And letter G is man's idea of holiness is often contrary to the word of God. Well, see, that's just men. Men and their self, they have ideas. That's like I said, that's why we need the word of God. That's why we have to test everything according to the Word of God. Like I like said, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to do a video about television. But the Wednesday after that, I'm actually going to do one about biblical judgment. Biblical judgment. Because, see, we are to test everything according to the Word of God. Because, see, like I said, that's why we have the Bible. That's why we need the Bible. Because my idea, a fleshly idea, that's often contrary to what God's laws are. Man-made. Like, why do we have so many different denominations out there, friend? Because men's ideas are different than God's ideas. Man's idea of holiness is often contrary to the Word of God. That's letter G. See, like Romans chapter number 7, winding down here. Coming upon letter H, just got a couple more of these to go and we will be finished. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 22. It says, For I delight in the law of God after... The inward man. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. See, a person with a heart with a heart for God will delight in God's holiness. See, the Apostle Paul says there, I delight in the law of God. I delight in God's holiness rather than my flesh. See, you have all these modern New Age Christianity people who want to drink their alcohol and, and do the heavy metal concerts and, and go watch the horror movies and all that stuff. Their problem is, the Apostle Paul nails it down here, they don't delight in the law of God, they delight in the flesh. Because see, God's Word has statutes. It has commandments, it, have mo it has morals, it has principles that God's people are to live by. A person with a heart for God will delight in God's holiness. They're not going to delight in the flesh. Then lastly here, letter I. Holiness leads to the perfect will of God. Romans chapter number 12. 
we'll read, really it's just verse 2, but I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Because this verse 1 here is really good, really goes right along with it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, first of all there, friend, you don't belong to yourself. A Christian doesn't belong to themselves. You belong to God. Like I remember I had a, a young lady who told that who told that to me before a teenage girl. She said, I'm just gonna she she claimed to be a Christian, claimed to be saved, and I was just telling her like really the principles we've been talking about, about living a holy separated life. She said, Well, I'm just gonna be me though and do what I wanna do. See, that's the mark of somebody who probably isn't even saved to begin with, as we said. Somebody who was saved, they're going to have a desire to live for God. And not just that, but I talked to that young lady for several, several days, and, and you know, I, I can't help it. I just got the gist. You know, her salvation wasn't biblical salvation. She didn't, you didn't see a desire in her to live for the Lord at all. You know, like I said, she told me she got saved. But, you know, so much she got saved, but, you know, she wasn't living a different life from when she was lost. Because, see, you don't belong to yourself. You to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. He says that is only your reasonable service. It's only your reasonable service. God's not asking anything uh, special or extraordinary out of you. Wanting you to present yourself a living sacrifice and holy, acceptable unto God. Well, God will accept anything. Now, yes, we know, thank God, He will accept every sinner. He will accept every sinner and save every sinner. But God will only accept believers who live holy lives. That is His standard. That's what that means, holy, acceptable unto God. We are to be believers who live holy, who rise above the ways of the world. Verse number two, and be not conformed to this world. See, we're not to be conformed to this world. We're not to try to be like the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Holiness leads to the perfect will of God. You really want to find the perfect will of God for your life? You got to live holy. See, you can't be living out in the wor out in the world and expect for the will of God to be carried out in your life. Because we read those verses there. God wants believers who are holy. God wants believers who are acceptable to Him, who are living that holy, separated life. See, like a carnal Christian, that's something that I've seen in the last year or so of my personal life. You know, seeking the will of God for my life, like going back to northern, northern New York to plant churches. Carnal Christians don't understand that. Like, why are you taking your wife, who's from the deep south in Alabama, and your, and your little daughter, like way up, way, way up to northern New York? around that kind of people, in that cold weather, etc. They don't understand it because they're carnal people. They feed their flesh more than they feed the Spirit of God. But only God's holiness leads to His perfect will. Romans 12.2, that was Romans 12.2, and you know, just lastly here, another very, very familiar text, I initially... When I got this message, didn't include this verse, but it, you know, just sums everything up really good. Very familiar, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and toucheth not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. See, there's two parts to that. First of all, you have to come out from among them and be separate. And touch not the unclean thing. See, don't even mess with it. Don't even touch it. See, it's best if you don't even touch Hollywood movies. Like we read that verse from 1 Thessalonians. Abstain from all appearance of evil. It's just best just abstain from it altogether. But there's a second part. And I will receive you. You're received to God. You're received into His service. To do whatever God wants you to do. 
God needs people everywhere. That's up to you and God. I'm actually also going to write an article about that. Hopefully in a week or two. It's been on my heart for a while about stirring up the gift that God has given you. Like Paul told Timothy, we all have our special gifts. Like, yes, you know, we all do have our have our own personalities. You know, God has just gifted some people to go to Africa, go to, go to South America, go to Asia, go to some third world country in a very different culture. You know, and plant churches like me. You know, God's given some people the gift, you know, to sit and study and write the word of getting right. You know, like Bible commentary, some people can sit several hours at a time and study the word of God. You know, that's just the gift God has given some people. You know, God's given some people the gift, you know, to be a hard worker. Like maybe it's just the will of God for you to open up your own landscaping company, you know, and be that and be an example in the community. You know, be a person who's honest in business, who does a good job. You know, God's given some men the gift, you know, to pastor churches with several hundred people. You know, we all have our, we all have our gifts. We've all got our different, uh, different battle stations. We've all got our, we've all got our particular will of God, things that we ought to be doing. But the only way you're going to get that is by living holy. We've said there, God wants holy separated believers. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and be where God wants you to be and also serve the world. It just doesn't work. May we have that heart for God. Thank you for listening to us this morning. Hope we've been a help and a blessing to y'all. What a needed a needed message for this day and time. Need a lot more people to proclaim it. Like uh, we, We'd love for you to do that. Like you get us on YouTube. You can share this message to whatever social media platform. Uh, sh- uh, <clears throat> share, it, share it with your family, your friends and all. And we need to keep us in your prayers. We live in horrible times. This isn't easy to do. I know it's not easy to live that holy separated life. We've got distractions out there. We've got worldliness. The devil hitting us on all sides. Like I mentioned, that young man that I want you to pray for, fired up young man. But he lives He lives. Up, he lives way up north in a horrible, horrible area. Like he described it to me. It's like living in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's very fired up. I, I've talked with him and prayed for him now, now several, several times times I met him through through my best friend from the military who passed away back in January but he's a very fired up young man but the devil's after him just like he's going to be after all of us you get a hold of this message you try to live holy you try to live separated you try to do something for God devil's going to be after you friend need to pray one for another I don't preach this message trying to sound self-righteous there's nothing good in me I come from a blue collar English American family from upstate South Carolina Nothing at all special about me this morning, just what God has done for me. Now, I've just got that desire to proclaim His Word, desire for another revival, so that's not what we need. Stay tuned with us. Like I said, be with us Tuesday or Wednesday, probably be Wednesday, but Tuesday or Wednesday, have our next video uploaded. Like I said, contact me. want to get our newsletter. We can help you in any way. Got a prayer request or anything, just contact us. Let us know. Be happy to pray for you, help you in any way we can. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for the goodness of sin. Thank you for your Word and what it means to us, as we said, not because I'm anything not because there's anything good in me this morning. I'm nothing. I'm just an old sinner, been saved by the grace of God. But you saved me, Lord. You did save me. And you called me to proclaim your word, Lord. And we just want to be used of you. And I pray that all of our listeners out there would be like that. They just want to be used of thee, Lord, no matter where they are. I know that's a great thing about our technology. We can reach people all over the world. And know how we need believers all over the world. We still need them in central Alabama. We need them in upstate South Carolina. Need them in upstate New York. Need them in Ontario, Canada. Lord, need them all around the world. Asia, South America, Africa, Australia, Europe. Oh, Lord. Oh, how we need men and women all over this world who will just love you, who will live that separated life and have a heart and a desire to be used to you. Like we thank you for that, Lord. No matter no matter where we come from, even even if uh, even if there's somebody out there just that's listening, Lord, that might literally live in poverty, that might be living in a third world country, Lord, you can use them as well. You can use anybody, Lord, and we need, I know, Lord, you need believers anywhere and everywhere that'll be used to thee, and we just pray that we would do that, Lord, in our facet, in that way, that'd be pleased unto thee, Lord, that we would find your perfect will for it's in Christ's name we pray, when out there listing laws, pray you convict them and save them, one discourage, encourage them, one backstab, reclaim them. 
Just help us do that work, Lord, that you'd have us do to build your kingdom in that fastest pleasing unto you, Lord, for it's in Christ's name I only pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening. I'm Dr. R.T. Cooper. We'll see you next time. <laughs>